Welcome to Identity Matters Podcast. Hi, my name is Steve Finney, and I will be your speaker today. Every believer needs to understand who they are in Christ. In our series, Identity Theft, we'll do just that. Help each believer truly know who they are in Christ. Thank you for joining us. Welcome, podcast listeners. If you're driving down the road, you might want to hang on to that wheel just a little bit tighter tonight. If you're sitting having a cup of coffee, you might want to put a little more sugar in it. Because we're going to talk about a topic that is very offensive. It may challenge many people, particularly if you're a gossiper. The most difficult people to deal with in Christian dumb, not D U M B, but dumb as in kingdom. The most difficult people to deal with are gossipers, because gossipers are very quick to protect, and the only way they can protect if they're caught gossiping is to what? To lie. Now, to lie is simply taking out a couple of little pieces. It, it's not necessarily coming up with a brand new story. Typically, what they say is, that's not exactly what I said. So, it is a very difficult group, us all being in that group, because the truth of the matter is, I don't know anyone, unless you can think of someone that you know, I don't know anyone that doesn't gossip. It is the easiest sin to slip into, and it's the toughest sin to crawl out of. So we're going to spend some time talking about this whole topic. The title comes under number 167 of the Identity Matters series, and this topic is called, You've Got Hate Mail. It happened to be I'm still waiting on the final statistics because we launched a booklet that is now equally being multiplied in our social networks. Our email itself uh, did definitely hit probably one of our top emails that we have done for eight years now. So that basically tells us that it is a topic that a lot of people were interested in. The title was catchy. It stop people, they wanted to read just enough to see if it was any interest to them, so the click-through ratio became very high because they stayed in and continued to read it. That helps us in understanding if we, we are able to maintain your interest. This particular um, email, which we turned into a booklet, and we released it as a booklet, is uh, now on its second wave. So you can be praying about that. So here's the overall goal and objective with You've Got Hate Mail. We had the email that went out. We now have a booklet. After this message is completed, we will have an audio set that will go with it. So there will be a PowerPoint, these slides that you're looking at. That PowerPoint will be packaged And that will be available in one container, online container, for pastors like Babu, who uses it in South India. Whatever it is I'm presenting today, he typically presents a week later. So he'll have the teaching lessons done for him. He'll have handouts of the written booklet if he wants to do that. He'll have the audio either for himself to listen to, because he typically likes to do the teaching, And that's our goal. Now what's going to follow this is another email we are sending out probably this next week sometime, and it is called Betrayal, the Kiss of Judas. So when I was studying the Hebrew, I discovered something very unique, is that 
Betrayal is what comes out of gossip. Now, you'll see a little bit of it in this presentation, but when I actually get into the Hebrew breakdown, you'll begin to see how important Hebrew words are. So when you look at gossip from a Hebrew perspective, if you keep tracking it, it'll literally show you what comes out of that type of sin or person. In that article or booklet, I just kept dropping in layers of Hebrew. So you find one word and you find out what that comes out of. Then you study that word, what that comes out of, and you keep doing it until it ends up in the conclusive statement of people who do betrayal. Online listeners, please listen very carefully. You'll definitely want to listen to this mini-series after you've got hate mail. But the conclusive statement is, because Satan is the father of chaos, and all of the common denominator words in the Hebrew study is chaos. Every one of them. And the Old Testament refers to Satan as the father of chaos. So you can be an indwelt believer at 602-292-2982. You can be an indwelt believer and serve Satan. That is very difficult to understand, I know. It doesn't mean you're of Satan, but you definitely can serve him. And there, you cannot serve two masters, so therefore when you are serving the false doctrines of Satan, they're called demonic doctrines, when you are quoting those and using those more than you are of the Word of God, you have shifted your focus on a different God. So lots of fun things coming up. Well, it's not really that fun, but... There's some great teachings coming up here over the next four weeks. Let's talk about our book of the week. This is one of our most downloaded booklets on the internet. It has been up there for many years. Remember when I showed you a couple weeks ago about the art of spiritual warfare? had 222,000 impressions. This one comes right underneath it. That tells us again that it is a topic, particularly amongst the members of the Catholic Church, are really wanting some answers. So what I did over the past two weeks is I completely expanded this writing project. I pulled in writings that I have worked on through the years And I first did the Greek and Hebrew study on what Christian is. I did the study on what it means to be indwelt. I did the study on how to be possessed by the Holy Spirit. And then I started at the earliest form of Catholicism. And I worked it forward until we have the statement made two years ago, November 11, where... Pope Francis came out and said that he is the leader of the one world religion. So it's a very powerful booklet now, asking that you pray as this thing continues to get downloads. So all you have to really do is you go to our website and you do the drop down menu to where it says Founders Publications. So all of these booklets, there's presently 102 booklets that I have done through the years. All of them will be reconditioned. I'm trying to do one or two a week, get them updated, reconditioned, put them in a quality booklet type of format so that people can tap or click on those booklets and it'll give them the PDF that they can use for teachings or whatever the case may be. It defines the authentic indwelt Christians. It reveals the history of the Catholics' fake doctrines. They literally stole things early on. The first hundred years, they literally stole manuscripts. And they would torture Christians, true indwelt Christians, 
who tried to preserve the gospel from this Roman state religion. It's a big deal. They've tried to hide it for many, many years. And now with modern technology and the information highway, it's difficult to hide. This is a great little booklet to get it all in one list. It's easy to read, too, because the paragraphs are about that long each, keeping it short, sweet, to the point, and people read the Catholic doctrine that I literally got out of their material and then the indwelt belief underneath it. It's very simple. So if you have someone who's trapped in that, it is a great resource for them to read the difference. It's just like Proverbs. Nasty statement, positive statement. Nasty statement, positive statement. Go online and check it out. It's free. Use it as God leads you to use it. Shannon, you want to come and read the scriptures for us? Okay, Matthew eighteen fifteen to 17. And if your brother sins, go and reprove him in private. If he listens to you, you have won your brother. But if he does not listen to you, take one or two more with you, so that by the mouth of two or three witnesses, every fact may be confirmed. And if he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen to even the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax gatherer. My guess is that the majority of the people that just heard that passage read to them cannot even tell me what it said. I really truly believe there are certain verses and passages that the enemy does a blackout in the minds of the people listening. And you can ask for instant recall and they cannot tell you what you said. It's one of the ways that we, we accomplish a single goal in discipleship if someone is under oppression of a demonic force. If they're able to remember and recall scripture, not quote it, but as I'm going to share with you at the end of this lesson, what it really means to learn and to be able to share what you heard either by the reading of the scripture or by someone preaching it. Now, if you think that the enemy is not active, if you think that the enemy is not trying to erase God's impact on your soul, right now, listener, then you are being deceived. The enemy wants you to forget before you remember it's the best way to trap you. It didn't, the seeds didn't even hit moist, cultivated soil. Most people come into a setting of learning with hard soil. And if you are an emergent type of make the people feel better, you are patting down that soil all the more. That's why my style of preaching is to be quick, hard, and dig deep the first 10 minutes and then drop the seeds in. That may not be everyone's style, but I'm here to tell you that the enemy is trying to blind you from hearing or seeing the truth. I cannot even tell you how many people have said to me, I read the Bible and I get nothing out of it. Or I'm reading and I, and I start getting distracted instantly because I think about my day. I think about what I got to get done. I think about, and they think that's some kind of human response. It is not. Your mind is being darkened and clouded by a force that is probably not known to you. So we need to pray for clarity. We need to pray that the seed gets in there. We need to pray that the holy blessing of the holy word becomes holy in your life. So at the end of tonight, I will be asking you a question. And if there's silence, 
I'll know exactly what is going on. Through this message, be praying, God, give me those impact statements from the Holy Spirit. So here's our first question. As a norm, whatever that is, what do most people do when they find out that someone is gossiping about them? Was the person who did the gossiping male or female? A conversation you had with a male or female? I want to show you something. This is the statistics that are gathered on gossip. This is not a real wide gap. I expected more. But it's 67% female and 55% male. Now what I was interested in is the type of males that are of the 55%. Because in surveys today, particularly surveys done on the church, they, are, they have put men in two separate columns. Women pleasers, they just can't say no to, to women, and that creates, as you might guess, all kinds of problems. And then the other one are, are men who take the lead. So I really do wonder of this 55%, how many of them cannot say no to a woman? They're basically confessing to being like Adam, hearkening to the voice of his woman. So. We have to ask ourselves, why is it that even statistics in the world, even though Barna does it through surveys in the church, why is it that women do or are more prone to gossip? Any answers? Okay. That's exactly, that's exactly was their summary. Is that women tend to enjoy talking about the details of relationships. Now keep in mind that 90 plus percent of items that are gossiped about have to do with, guess what? Relationships. There's your connect. It is as simple as that. Men tend to put task first and relationship second. So if they're going to gossip, typically what they gossip about is their wife's gossip. Hey, did you hear that uh, Johnny's wife is, you know, blah, blah, blah? Gossip is not a feminine sin. It's a sin, period. And we're going to discover that tonight. And anyone can jump into it. Most of us do. Very quickly, in fact. There's some kind of psychological comfort that comes with gossip. What in the world would that be? Gossipers only gossip about the things they're guilty of. It's to cover, and all of my Hebrew friends and teachers, you know this, gossip is to cover one's own sin. So there you have it. And it does tie in with a lot of what all has been said. Now that the cat's out of the bag and there's gossip flying around, we got to take a look at something and a few more questions. Let's go back to the scripture that Shannon read earlier to us. Again, it says, if, if, if. Now, I know that the Lord only said it once, but, you know, us humans need the triune of reminders. If your brother sins, go and show him his fault in public. Rip him up, tear him down, expose him, make him feel like an idiot. No, that's not what it says. It says, go to him and confront him of his fault privately. 
Now there's something being revealed here to me that is a little bit mysterious. This is actually revealing to us the solution that happens to be opposite of the sin that was committed. Gossip is public and they have no fight in admitting that it is a public adventure that they are on. So going to them in private puts the whole focus on the opposite of what they believe protects them. To put yourself in a position of protection, you have to expose someone else. And that is what has happened. If you go to the person privately, you hear gossip from someone about someone else or whatever, there's a real simple technique that you use that my wife and I were taught is you hold up the hand. You don't even have to say anything. You just hold up the hand. It's the old adage of speak to the hand. You stop the person and you say, I don't need to hear this. You need to go to that person privately. The, the, the keys, the golden keys that are being given to us are in this passage. It goes on, it says, if he listens to you, now this is assuming you have proof that he has sinned. This is with proof. This isn't with gossip. This is with proof that the person that you're going to, you have proof by two witnesses for sure that they sinned. So if he listens, you have won your brother. But if he does not listen to you, take one or two more with you so that by the mouth of two or three witnesses, every fact may be confirmed. Then it goes on, says, if he refuses to listen to them, you go tell it to your church. You don't tell your neighbor, you tell it to your church. And that would be your pastor. Because the pastor is obligated by church law, which is set in motion by God, is obligated to follow these steps. Right? That's not that complicated. So you would go to your church and tell it to the church, and if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile or a tax gatherer, which is basically a heathen, an unbeliever. Now that's with proof that they have sinned. Now if the gossiper cannot muster up the courage to face someone face to face privately, then it's a confession that they're a coward. Now, I have suffered with being a coward most of my life. So I'm not just preaching out of the corner of my mouth here. I have suffered cowardly behavior my entire life. And something happened to me many years ago where I said, because I heard, I will not cower anymore. And a boldness shot forth out of me in teaching, preaching, writing, whatever it is that I do. You see, it's okay to admit at 602 that you are a coward. And if you're a gossiper, you are a coward. And as our article said that with our local gossip thing my wife and I have had to deal with, not once in eight years has anyone approached us. Eight years. No one has approached us and gone through this process. Now the conclusion for the one, the victim that is being gossiped about is none other than I, I must not have committed any sin. So the crazy thing about it, the gossipers literally are mounting up condemnation upon themselves. It'll turn on them. Usually the counsel, which is probably what you got, Deborah, usually the counsel is, don't do that. Don't say that and don't respond. 
You may ask for a private meeting just to try to resolve their sin, but typically it doesn't go that way. So here's some key questions. How often does a gossiper come to you and conduct a Matthew 18? Does anyone have a story here? That someone called you and said, I need to sit down and confess my sin of gossiping toward you and make it right and blah, blah, blah? Does anyone have a story? 602-292-2982, text me right now. I'd love to hear the story. So what we do is we take that story and go null and void. See, that is not a direct approach to saying, I have sinned against you, or I need to talk to you about a sin I observed about you. Big difference. Because see, that person had no prerogative to approach you on that period. It's the person who witnessed it and has another witness to verify their witnessing it and then the person who has that witness goes to the person privately. Not with the other witness, not yet. You've been listening to Identity Matters Podcast. We appreciate having you join us today. Feel free to log on to our website at www.iomamerica.org. We have lots of resources available for you on the believer's identity in Christ. Again, thank you for joining us.